Welcome to a new Pharma Forum podcast. In this episode, I speak with Dr. Brigham Hyde, co-founder and CEO of Atropus Health, and Adi Arianpo, co-founder and CEO of Seekster. The two discuss their company's recent partnership, seeking to bring into reality personal registries and make tangible the notion of the digital front door of care, which comes back to data, to patient information and high quality at that. There's much to take in here, and so I will pretty much leave the podcast to speak for itself, but I urge you to listen closely and perhaps even listen again and pay heed for the purposes of insightful progress into the central focus of personalised healthcare of tomorrow. If you've any comments on the episode, please feel free to drop us a line. Otherwise, as ever, thank you for listening. This is web editor Nicole Raleigh, and today I have as guests Dr Brigham Hyde, co-founder and CEO of Atropus Health, and R.D. Arianpal, co-founder and CEO of Seekster. Welcome both. Thanks for having us. Excited to be here. Thank you so much, Nicole. So Atropus was founded in 2020 and is an AI company translating real-world clinical data into personalized evidence and insight with the goal of democratizing access to real-world evidence. 2016 founded Seekster, meanwhile, is a patient-centric healthcare data technology company, and its digital front door platform integrates into payer, provider, or clinical research enterprises to provide interoperability for retrieving and harmonizing disparate data sources into longitudinal, multidimensional patient portals. In the US, Indeed, Seekster has nationwide coverage of EHRs from hospitals and medical groups, genomic DNA, wearables, pharmacy, and social determinants of health data. Now, the two companies are partnering to enable the creation of personalized registries. Indeed, today our discussion will orbit around the general notion of the digital front door for patient information. However, before we get into the details of that, perhaps each of you could tell listeners a little bit more about yourselves and your respective journeys to where you are today doing what you do. Artie, would you like to go first? The honor is yours, Brian, please. Great. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Atropos Health. I help spin the business out of Stanford University. My co-founders, Nigam Shah and Sarv Gumbar. Our idea was uh, known as the green button within Stanford. Basic idea. We press the green button and get a second opinion from all this great healthcare data that we've, we've created over the last 15 years. And our focus is on automation of that last five yards. You know, once already gathers the data for me, can we create an answer very quickly and do it, you know, with great uh, user experience? So even a physician who has a busy day can find a few minutes to write a question, a couple of sentences and get a clean, clear answer back the highest quality and, and transparency uh, to help inform care. My background, I started as a PhD uh, bench scientist. So I was experimenting at the bench side, but I could see that uh, data was going to play a big part um, of this next several decades, I think, um, and started building companies uh, in the early 2000s uh, to help chase that. Worked with companies like Decision Resources Group, Concert AI, and Eversana along that path. but. When I saw what Nigam and Sarba developed at Stanford, I felt this was the potential step change in a process that currently takes weeks and months. It's very uh, labor intensive, and we had the chance to compress that. Um, and our relationship with Seekster fits right along that path. You know, we need to be connected to the best data sets in the world in order to provide answers to clinicians and researchers who have them. And uh, this partnership makes a ton of sense in that light. Over to you. Great. Thanks so much uh, for that amazing introduction and for the partnership, uh, Brigham. We're so excited. And Nicole, thank you so much for having us on your amazing podcast. Um, we're big fans of Pharma Forum. And I'm Artie Arianpour, CEO and co-founder of Seekster. Myself, along with my two co-founders, Dana and Sean, uh, founded Seekster in 2016 when no one actually believe that you can bring all your health data in one place. It all happened kind of by accident. 
we had this vision of creating the mint.com of healthcare. And the big vision was actually at the time there were 7 billion plus. Now there's 8 billion plus people on our little planet or spaceship that we call Earth. The big vision was to get everyone to own, collect, and share their data to advance medicine. Um, I spent 15 plus years in precision medicine and uh, more specifically around clinical diagnostics, launching um, some of the most premier. DNA sequencing tests um, and taking next gen sequencing to the clinic. My co founder and I, Dr. Sean Lee, actually invented the clinical exome test and launched it in 2011 for diagnostic odysseys and for children. And we learned a lot about what data was really missing um, because genome data doesn't tell the whole story. And then in 2013, I happened to be part of the SCOTUS decision for. Uh, gene patents, if everyone remembers that. My mom is a breast cancer survivor, so I was very motivated in taking down a company called Marriott Genetics, and I was one of four people that actually was able to do that and prevail um, in federal court. Um, the result of that was an exit with Ambry Genetics being sold to Kanaka Minolta and the Sovereign Fund in Japan for one billion U.S. dollars, and then afterwards. Um, you know, we started Seekster because we didn't want to retire. <laughs> we thought we were going to create some little pizza shop. We didn't know that we were going to create, you know, the Costco of data, I guess you can say. If I'm talking early in the morning um, about uh, analogies with food and scale and logistics and things. But um, our first use case was actually Alzheimer's. And that's why you see a little purple, you know, line above the Seekster green colors. Um, and that was because my grandmother suffered from Alzheimer's disease. And I wanted to create a multi-generational health record for a patient registry that would bring in my grandma's data, my mom's data, my data, and we can pass it on to, you know, generations in our family, number one. Number two, uh, we can advance medicine and science by a multi-generational health record. So we actually filed the first patents in 2016 on a multi-generational health record that in turn became a longitudinal health record. And um, throughout, you know, the last eight years, um, it's been an incredible journey. We've always been thinking about AI. And if you look at my recent JP Morgan post, our first poster that we had, the first word was actually artificial intelligence. We knew that we had to figure out AI, but I didn't want us to be an AI company because that's not what our expertise was. And when I got to know Brigham for the past couple of years and his expertise and his data experience, he understood Seekster better than anyone that I had ever met actually in the industry. And we became friends. We almost partnered multiple times, but then he moved on to bigger things. And then when we were at a conference talking about Seekster and his new gig at Atropo Health. Um, I was very excited to learn more. And then when our teams met and our co-founders met, it was a match in heaven. We were just so excited that we can actually, you know, bring food to the AI that um, Atropo has created for um, real world evidence generation in an instant, because my company creates a patient registry in an instant, brings a longitudinal health record in an instant. And so the combination of what Brigham has done with my team, I think is not going to change healthcare. It's going to traject us into a new era that the industry has not seen yet. And I couldn't be more excited about the possibility. Nicole, I think uh, the way I already described that last point is just it. You know, and in, in my previous roles um, in the work that Artie's done going back you know, all the way to the genomics world. Think of this in phases. In the 2000s, we had to create data. There was not data, okay? And that started with genomics, that started with testing data, that started with meaningful use and the creation of electronic medical records. That was problem one. Okay, we've accomplished that. There's a lot of data, okay? Step two in the 2010s is already saying those data sources were disparate. 
Uh, they were in different locations, some of them on physical servers, some of them uh, in the cloud in the early days, some of them still on paper, for me being honest. And now gathering them became the challenge. And, and I think that's where Seekster's story started. It's gone many places post that. And where I think we are now is we have data. It exists. Uh, it's in the cloud, which means simply it can be gathered and connected, which is what Seekster is great at. Uh, there's a lot of hard work to be able to do that. But a solution like Seekster enables us to, with a patient consent, pull all their records together in one place, create that longitudinal record. That's all great. Let's just be frank, though. That doesn't solve the problem of finding insights from that. And the problem that's been created for pharma, I'll just point out, is that we've got all this data. It's all been combined. It's safe, secure in the cloud. Okay, great. Now what? And now what right now the state of affairs is that you have to hire an army of people, programmers, researchers, statisticians, and they're going to take weeks and months to do these analyses. And it's difficult to do it, not only because it's complex and you know because it requires very high standard of research methodology, but it's going to take a long time. And that's where we focused. And if you think about the starting dates of our company, it tells you a lot. Also tells you why I need great partners from the era in which already started this business. Because our solution helps close that last gap which is, I have data, great. I have an awesome registry. Okay, how do I get some answers to these research questions? I'll take an example, you know, the GLP-1 drugs that are out, Manjaro and Ozempic, they're transforming chronic disease around obesity and diabetes. Well, you know what? That's having a lot of impacts we weren't expecting, okay? Like, what happens to the other diseases that these patients might have had or might get? Are those affected by this drug? Is Monjaro affecting heart disease, even though it's being used to treat obesity? What about the other medications they were on? Are those shifting? Those types of questions are coming up every day in research and have major impact on these pharma companies involved. But also, you know, at the point of care, you know, do I treat a patient differently now who's on Monjaro? How will that shift? And usually having to get answers to those questions could take the better part of a year. But what if I could know today? And what if I could get that insight? And what if I could bring that insight out to impact care and make sure these patients are being optimized? In a research setting, when you spend millions of dollars to establish a registry, um, let's shorten the time it takes once you do that to get an insight. And with Seekster, they can stand up and connect all these records almost instantly. Right. And that's new. I mean, five, 10 years ago, that was a much more arduous process. The fact you can do that instantly means we've got a registry, we've got that data pulled together in the cloud. Now with Atchpo, I can ask a question of it that same day. And I think that's fundamentally what we're talking about is speed to insight, speed to value. And uh, it's here today. Thank you for that, both of you. So sticking with that notion of speed and the concept of automation sort of closing up that gap you were mentioning the last five yards i just want to look at the perhaps specifics or perhaps the link between how it is in the us as opposed to the uk when it comes to this notion of the digital front door for patient information so in the uk the notion of that digital front door for patient information was explained back in october 2022 by one professor jonathan banger of nhs england who introduced the national digital channels platform and integration strategy aiming to make our digital channels more open collaborative and efficient across the health and care system so when it comes to america and to the work you've been describing of Atropos Health and Seekster, what does the concept of the digital front door mean for patients in the United States? Yeah, I can I can take that first, Brigham, if that's okay. So, Nicole, I think the digital front door that we created was for patients and researchers. And the reason being is because you have to have a front door where people can actually either click on a button upload data, collect data, share data, et cetera. Now, um, in the United States, there's a different interoperability problem than there is across the UK 
and uh, EU and even South America and um, PAC Asia. Um, we've been dealing with it actually globally, and um, I know a lot about it because of the interest across various different governments that are trying to make their data interoperable and also marry a digital front door so that their citizens can have access to such a thing. The NHS is a great example because, you know, there's 70 million plus people in the UK. There's one system. It's the NHS, unlike in the US, where you have 5,000 plus healthcare systems, 200,000 plus providers. Your small doctor's office in Arkansas doesn't talk to your dermatology office in La Jolla, doesn't talk to Memorial Sloan Kettering, you know, out in New York, doesn't talk to MD Anderson in Texas if you're a cancer patient or a melanoma patient. Granted, if you are just taking a GLP-1 drug, as Brigham was speaking about that, and if you're traveling and let's say you have some adverse side effect of some sort and you have to go to the, some ER you know, um, or urgent care, those systems don't talk to another because the EMR systems are completely different. We have about 28 main electronic medical systems that power the healthcare in the U.S., but in the UK, there's one system. It's the NHS. In the Netherlands, it's one system. In Switzerland, it's a little bit different. In Germany, it's a little bit different. So, you know, the digital front door really is um, not, I would say, the same for every geographic region. The concept, though, is what's important. Having one place, whether that's a digital front door for a patient registry that, you know, Pfizer, J&J, AstraZeneca are going to launch to get their patients onboarded and the consented patients already um, part of it so that both Seekster and Atropos Health can do the magic that our companies do. And I think we explained in combination how we make one plus one equal 10 because we bring all of the beginning stuff and Brigham finishes it off with the insights and the AI on the real world evidence. Yeah, let me, let me frame your, uh, your question and, and Artie's comments a little bit. So digital front door, let's think of two topics. One topic is data and data collection, where it lives, and privacy. The other side of that question is digital front door of patient experience and being able to get care digitally. So I'm going to take those separately. Let's do the data side first, which Artie was touching on. In Europe, in the UK, uh, there's additional regulation around GDPR and privacy that is fundamentally different than the US, although also in the US, we have HIPAA, we have a focus on protecting data. And let's just sum it up really simply. I think all of us would agree as patients, yeah, I, I might like to be able to access my own data. I might want to contribute my data to a research study, right? And that's one of the great things that Seekster does through a consent platform. You know, I can opt into this registry and participate. What I want to know, I want to know that it's being done safely and securely. I want to know that that data is not being misused in any way. I want to know that it's being kept safe. And yeah, I'd love it if it contributed to research, but I don't want it to be used, you know, by a company to do something I don't want it to do. Okay. I think a, a base statement I have for you is that the infrastructure digitally that we have as an industry, seeks to a big part of this, is now at a point where that can be done. And there are companies like DataVant and Health Verity, which, you know, sort of led the way on uh, the identification of records. There's the cloud infrastructure itself and great consent platforms that enable patient frictionlessly to decide, yeah, I want to be part of this. This is what I'm contributing my data for and nothing else, right? So the layers exist and they're being deployed all over the world. And I, I think it's just the right way to do things, okay? There was work I did when I was found in Concert AI. We worked with ASCO, uh, an oncology society in the U.S. And ASCO ran a survey and they asked patients, they said, hey, like, would you be willing to contribute your data if that was going to be used to help the next patient 
you know, the next generation. And I, I forget the exact number, but it was something like 80% of patients said, absolutely, right? People want to do this and they're willing to do it. And frankly, when, when we do this, it advances care, it advances R&D, uh, the next discovery. And that's the reason why there's momentum behind this. All of that said, okay, I think Atropos and Seekster, this partnership represents a key fundamental for us, which is when Seekster sets up a registry and collects this data, brings it together in the Seekster cloud, I don't want that data to go anywhere, okay? We've agreed to put it in a safe, secure place, and we built our technology as a federated technology. What does that mean? That means I'm going to install technology in that cloud that Seekster has that's going to enable our solution to run, enable us to run studies really rapidly or answer clinical questions. That means the data possession does not change, okay? Wherever that data is in the world, frankly, it stays there. And a, a big point for Atchpo is we've uh, gone internationally and working today in South America and, and in Asia Pacific, soon to be Europe. What I continually hear from people is, okay, great. So whatever my national, local, uh, international regulations are on data privacy and security, that doesn't change at all when you use Atropos Health. One of the things that made our partnership here so easy, because I don't have to have him adjust his infrastructure at all. I'm just going to install with his tech, and it's going to work that way. If you're in Europe and you're dealing with GDPR, this is an even bigger deal. Um, and I would say, you know, in our solution, like, GDPR regulation, how the data is stored, secured, et cetera, does not change an ounce when we're installed. I just fundamentally believe, you know, we have all these cloud providers, the data is in the cloud. We have great the identification, security provisioning. Great. Let's just keep that and build on top of it. And I think our approach to that is being really well received. It's one of the things that leads to great partners like this. All right, that's box one. Let me go to box two, digital front door. And, you know, you referenced the NHS. Fundamentally, what I think this is about is, is about being able to interact with healthcare without needing to go inside a brick and mortar location. Okay. And if you think about that, part of it is, you know, solutions like telehealth and being able to access physicians, being able to prescribe, you know, digitally, you know, being able to get the care you need when digital is appropriate. One thing we found, and I've referenced our partnership with Mayo Clinic here. You know, Mayo Clinic provides e-consults uh, to a whole set of network members in their MCCN network. Um, when they saw what we did, they said, oh, interesting. Um, what if we put Atropo in our e-consult workflow? And they do thousands a year globally. And what if somebody sends a question and they're, they're thinking they need to talk to a Mayo expert? What if we see if Atropo on top of the Mayo data, again, securely held in the Mayo cloud environment, what if we can answer that question using data first? And what if providing that even more rapidly than you could even schedule an e-consult leads to the key insight that somebody needs? And as I talk to healthcare institutions and, you know, you talk to CEOs of major hospitals or care centers, what they're thinking about is what is the digital front door of my institution? Maybe of the NHS, you know, maybe of uh, an oncology center, maybe a Mayo Clinic. Is it the only way I can think about it is like, isn't the best definition of that is how were millions of patients like you treated here? Is that not the definition of what being treated at the Mayo Clinic is? And we're able to show the answer to that question on a patient just like you, you know, a 65-year-old uh, Hispanic female with a history of X, Y, and Z, diabetes, these treatments. Well, guess what? I have thousands, tens of thousands, even more sometime of those patients that I can see in our system. Why don't we say, how were they treated? How were you treated? How would you be treated? And so I think the digital front door of care comes back to data because what you want to know is how should these people be treated? And let's personalize it. And let's make it a great user experience that, you know, you can get an answer back in a day or even instantly now with our, our tool, ChatRWD, which is an LLM-based interface. So the idea of digital front door, I think it is, how were you treated? Right. And how are people like you treated in the past? And what's the best recommendation? So I, I view Atchpo sitting on Seekster as providing that answer. Right. If we're standing up registries of millions of patients of a certain type, let's tell everybody how they were treated. Um, and that's the fundamental shift, I think, here that we're, we're both enabling. Yeah. And I, I'm going to add real quick to this, um, Nicole. 
to what Brigham just said. So, you know, with our one-click records for healthcare and life sciences, you can retrieve a patient's longitudinal health record in seconds, and you can confirm study eligibility and query that population cohorts via the admin portal, which is a digital front door, you know, on the back end for the stakeholders that are actually doing the research so that they can utilize technologies such as Brigham's Atropo Health within the Seekster instance. And one clarification is patients own this data. Seekster does not own the data. Atropos does not own the data. It's consented, right? Number one. Number two, whether how it's onboarded in the use case and how they come through that digital front door is different for an oncology study than it is with an Alzheimer's study where they use our caregiver feature so that I can bring for my power attorney, my grandmother's data to the next Biogen Alzheimer's, you know, big study. So based off the disease, it's also different on how it works because of different features that we built over the past eight years. And now with Atropos Health Edition, it's um, a complete end-to-end solution for healthcare and life science stakeholders. We're really excited. I call it one-click patient registries with our one-click records. It's literally one click and you get everything. Thank you for that. And thank you both for that very replete response to the question. So we're still, we've got this sort of um, on-running thread at the moment with speed, acceleration, mentioned many times that sort of instant, instant information. But I just want to segue slightly away from acceleration for a second and think about uh, the patients, think about the quality of the data For instance, Brigham, at one point you said patients just like you, this would be the answer for you. So thinking about data quality, I mean, a recent study found that only 14% of daily medical decisions are made based on high quality evidence. And additionally, many methods of data gathering are flawed and unreliable in clinical trials, proving there's this great need to improve patient care through the use of existing and new data. Further, the data to be trusted and utilised by researchers and patients, there need to be avenues for easy access to data and a transparent breakdown of exactly where the evidence came from. And this obviously is the reasoning behind your partnership between Atropos and Seekster. So can you tell us more in this regard and maybe also describe for listeners different types of data gathering and developments? Yeah, uh, this is a really important topic. And I I would say critical to our users is understanding, great, you've produced an answer for me, how do I know the data underneath it was any good or appropriate for this question? And, you know, I think for me, that that starts with shining a big, bright light on the question directly. Okay. You talked about 14% of daily medical decisions have high quality evidence. That's the, the stat that we are trying to change as a company. Okay. And let's, let's think of it as an evidence pyramid. And this is actually taught uh, in the academic part of this world. The, the gold standard, the top of the top, of course, is double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized clinical trials. It doesn't get better than that. That uh, can ensure and is ensured through regulation that we're capturing everything about the patient, that nothing is modified or changed in the underlying data. It's collected on consistent time points. And the running of the trial, how patients are enrolled, what arm they end up in is, you know, has bias removed from it. Of course, the best. Let's at the same time make an adjacent statement, which is there are not enough clinical trials. Okay. And we want more. And I'm all for anybody who wants to do more clinical trials. In fact, registries are a great way to get close to that, but they're not going to be enough. They're expensive. They're hard to run. They're primarily driven around regulatory approvals. And so the trials that do get run are focused on those topics. We need a way to supplement that uh, top of the pyramid. And as you move down that pyramid, observational research, real world data, it is, it is here already and here to stay. If you look at the publication literature and the growth of uh, studies and published studies, those that find their way into guidelines coming from real world data, 
it's already a significant part of the story. We would argue it should be even more. And one of the reasons that it's so critical to do this, and I know this from talking to regulators, uh, Sean Cozen, who formerly ran FDA's Cedar Oncology, their development division, you know, the trials themselves have trouble. And in the following sense, they tend to be run on healthy individuals, those without comorbidities or other chronic disease, and they tend to be small those studies. And if you're a regulator and you're approving a drug, for instance, on the basis of one of those trials, you know in the back of your mind that tomorrow after you approve it, it's going to be used in a patient who might have been excluded from that trial. And wouldn't you like to know how it would have performed in them? And real world data is honestly the answer to that. Uh, it's why with the 21st Century Cures Act in the US, there's been a big push to include uh, this signal, not only in the regulatory process, but beyond. With, with ATCHPO, you know, truly, we create new studies every day um, that are larger than the largest clinical trial ever run on that topic. And many of our studies go on to be published. I'm uh, proud to say we have a 100% peer review success rate on every study we've ever published. Every piece of our methodology and how we do our studies is already in the literature and can be cited in top journals like New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, JAMIA, JCO, and the, and the like. So first and foremost, be transparent. How are we doing this, right? How's the data collected? How are we doing the analysis? The second thing that, uh, that came about, and I think it's a great uh, sort of connected tissue to why we partner with companies like Seekster, the question started to come up. Uh, even in the early days for us, hey, you know, if I could run this study on data set A or data set B, right, which one should I use, right? Maybe we want, we want a way to evaluate that. And so we created our data fitness scoring solutions to solve for this issue. So I can run a study on two separate data sets that can be different for many reasons. And I will actually give you a credit score at the top that says, hey, how well fit? is this data set for this question? And we're also very transparent in how that's done. Uh, we're getting ready to publish a, a publication on this. Very simply, I would say, I wanna know, are the records complete? You know, Do I have everything that happened to that patient over a timeline? Are there errors or missingness in the underlying data? Is it of high quality? Maybe in certain cases, are there elements, could be in a registry, things like we've collected all the genomic testing for these patients. That makes that data more valuable or accurate for certain questions. Maybe certain partners have curated the notes associated with these patients. And it's not just structured data. It's everything the, the physician wrote down. And when you enhance data and, and uh, folks like Seekster who do a great job making sure we gathered everything that happened, which I would just say is not easy to do. I mean, if you're looking at a health systems EMR, they don't have the data from when that patient walked across the street and filled their script uh, at CVS. They don't have the online testing that patient ordered. So having a registry means I can pull from all those pipelines, pull it all together. Artie's data, the data that he's pulling together in Seekster for one of these registries, almost always will score higher in our system for these questions. And my point is, let's make that clear to the researchers asking that question or even clinicians when they end up wanting to use this. So having data fitness score and that credit score is the key to shining a light on this issue and helping people understand this answer I just got from Atropos, you know, how good is it? You know, how good's the data behind it? Hey, maybe I wanna run this on multiple data sets and see which one's the best, right? And it also, I think, helps our data partners. And, you know, with this partnership, Seekster joins the Atropo Evidence Network Right now, there are over 200 million patients in the U.S. Uh, on that network. We're adding internationally right now, today in Brazil, uh, Colombia, Japan, and soon to be elsewhere. Let's match the question you've got to the right data set for it. And let me just even be explicit. If I'm international and I'm asking a question, uh, let's say about lung cancer, and my patient is Japanese, I might want to know the answer to that question on Japanese patients. Right. And I think when we speak to folks internationally, this lack of representation internationally of these populations in trials is a big issue because they're having to determine care on clinical trials run in the US and Europe. Right. So let's enable that that match. And I think 
you know, for our partners uh, on the evidence network, the other thing we like to do is we turn those scores right around back to them. And we say, hey, guys, here's where you're scoring well. You're doing great in oncology with this data set. But hey, you know, over here, we're not scoring as well. And we, we like to give that value back and say, here's how you might improve. Like, already, maybe, um, you know, in your Alzheimer's data set, it'd be great if we had certain imaging data. It would enhance the value of it. And that helps him determine what to go get next. And, you know, I think that transparency, shine the light on it, you know, is going to be better for everybody in this ecosystem. And imagine doing all that with real-time, real-world data. That is the cherry on top. So what we focused on, and the reason why Brigham and Atropa partnered with us isn't because, you know, just the access that we have on a nationwide scale to data, but it's the fact that when intervention happens at the ER, from the gentleman that was in a clinical trial or part of a patient registry and he was on his bike and he was at Mammoth Mountain because there's great snow now in California. Finally, we, we've had some rain over the weekend and he broke his arm, you know, skiing. And then he had to get on his bike and he breaks his leg going to the ER. We get that data before even the physician reports it. It's pretty amazing. It's instantaneous and it's real time. It comes directly from chain of custody. So speaking about quality, we can only assure the quality by knowing where the source of data and where the data comes from. A lot in the past, and this is what's really interesting, Brigham and I started because we're pretty much the same age in the early 2000s in our careers. And as he mentioned at the beginning of the podcast to the audience here, he was said something really interesting. I don't know if you guys heard it, but he focused on the fact that, you know, we used to have to create data. Mm -hmm. Now we have focused on how to actually combine data because there's billions of data sets out there. There's millions of data sets being created every day. Just on this, you know, podcast, how many people lost their life because they weren't able to get the right data at the right time to either a patient, a caregiver, a provider, or get them in a clinical trial where they could have gotten some sort of, you know, drug or medicine that could have helped them for their condition to either live longer or advance research. All this stuff is siloed. And that's really the big problem. That's why I was so excited in partnering with Brigham and his team is because it takes us one step closer to generating, you know, the last mile. And it takes us two steps further in actually launching a patient registry that's turnkey with all the bells of whistle, you know, not just at the beginning of collection, but afterwards for the insights. And for the deep, you know, analysis that needs to be done. And obviously, the last thing is we save healthcare a ton of money. I don't know the number, but McKinsey will do some sort of report on this once we, you know, announce our next customers that are utilizing our combined technologies. But it's about saving healthcare money, saving lives, as well as bringing that real-time, real-world data that's not static like the IQVIA um, and the other companies that are selling de-identified bulk data that's super static. Ours is not like that. It's a whole game changer. Yeah, I, I want to make two points here quickly. One, on cost savings. The way that data is gathered for a registry today is incredibly arduous and expensive. And I think whether you're a pharma company, you're a provider doing that, you know, there's other groups, societies. I mean, the solution that Seeks just created is a direct cost savings on the current way that's done. At the same time, on the Atpo side of the equation, I mean, we have stats from pharma partners, but, you know, in our first six months at J&J, &J, which we had a, a pilot last year, we had 10 users. We saved them over a million dollars in consulting fees and staffing in the first six months. 
And all of that savings is great, hard dollar savings, make it cheaper. What is more valuable than that is the speed to insight. Because being able to get a study done that helps you get a drug approved faster, design a better clinical trial, make a better clinical decision, the value on that is, you know, the top is off. You know, like it's outside the box. Like if you're able to get a it's drug priceless. If you're able to get a drug approved when you wouldn't have been able to, we're talking about hundreds of millions of value. And speed is the key to that. The last point I'll mention, if you're in pharma, increasingly the FDA in the US is focused on a concept called GXP compliance, which when you're talking about data and you mentioned quality, you want to be able to know where did that data come from? You know, one of the things about a clinical trial, it's governed by something called CFR Part 11 compliance. And in that, the electronic data capture ensures when a data point is created, it's captured, stored, and available for audit. So if the FDA wants to go back and review every patient record in detail and have the, the history, the auditable history of how the data was created, they can do it. That is not required in the rural data space today, but we, both already and I believe that that should be the standard on some level. So with this solution, if a pharma company is running, use Atropa, runs a study on Seekster data, Already, already has the ability to go back and provide those audit logs. And I have the ability to track and store and audit the elements of the study I ran. And I think while not required yet, we should all just be doing that. And I think that goes back to the confidence, the quality, and that's what will open up, I think, even more regulatory opportunity for the use of this data. Thank you. So before we look finally at that, that horizon of opportunity to come, I just want to, you've, you've mentioned transparency, high quality, combination. I want to think about the hows. You mentioned also, Adi, the, the word magic. How is the magic done? In, in this podcast, is there perhaps a smidgen of the magic tricks of technology that either of you are using that you can share? Yeah. So look, in 2016, when I founded the company, it was all about seeking health data, right? And it was combining DNA sequencing, hence the word SEQ seek with stir, which is the cocktail of EMR claims, pharmacy, and all that stuff. We didn't know how we were going to do it. And to be honest with you, um, I've said this on multiple um, other podcasts, and I'll say it on this one as well. It was an accident. We did not know how difficult it was. I thought that medical data was interoperable the same way that genomic data was interoperable. And what I mean by that is um, I was one of the first um, folks in the world to be clinically under CLIA whole genome sequenced when I was 29 years old back in 2009. And at that point, I noticed that everything is ATCG, ATCG, ATCG. It didn't matter if it came off an Illumina sequencer, an applied biosciences sequencer, or a Thermo Fisher sequencer, such as you know, ion torrent or Oxford nanopore, um, any type of technology within sequencing. And so within just one EMR system, let's say Epic, for example, in the United States, and let's take Kaiser, for example, in the state of California that covers 12 million lives, their Northern California system does not talk to their Southern California system in the same states. Your name can be a dot Arianpur in one EMR, and then the other one can be Arty dot Arianpur or Arty slash Arianpur. So early on, we noticed this and we said, oh my gosh, how are we going to do this? And how we did it, and the secret was all the dirty engineering. No one wanted to fund it. No VC wanted to fund it. No strategic wanted to fund it. The reason why we have what we have and companies like Atropos Health want to partner with us isn't because we're likable. Maybe we got some great swag. Maybe they like us, you know, but it's because we have the right solution and we've deployed that across Fortune 5 companies. You know, we're partnered with United Healthcare Group and we're doing all the patient registry work for them. They're the largest insurer in the in 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 the United States. We have, you know, a dozen patient registries that we've launched from the National Pancreas Foundation to the Multiple Sclerosis Association of the United States 
powering, you know, what Brigham has been talking about on this call. You, you, um, know, you know what I like to say, Nicole? I like to say there's no such thing as magic. There's only hard work. Okay. And that's the thing that has impressed me about Seekster and It RDA. took eight years. <laughs> what he's saying. And this is this is the thing. It's like anybody can have a vision of let's connect all the healthcare data. Okay. I think we all could agree yeah. that it happened. Have you gone out and knocked on all the doors and made all the agreements and done all the mapping and build build the pipes? That's just hard work. I mean And then having those customers actually make it better for you. So we had Accenture, McKinsey, PwC, we had all these folks once Takeda invested, give us millions, tens of millions of dollars of consulting. And Brigham understands from his concert AI experience how valuable that is because like he said, everyone has the idea of connect all the data. How do you actually put in the use well, and can you do it? And this is why we're we're soul sisters, I guess. I mean, the automation that we do, I think everybody could say, yeah, I'd love to be able to instantly get an answer from all the millions of records. I think we all know that. The technology and the, the work that built this company goes back to 2015, okay? And the work within Stanford began at that point. And it's a lot of hard work. There's no magic AI. There's no magic LLM. Just hard slogging work. The magic is not giving up and being fearless and relentless. That's what it is. And, and I think, you know, if I pull the curtain back further on that, I mean, there we have IP around this, of course, and, you know, continue to develop that. But it's hardcore automation. What does it take to speed up a study? Right. At scale, oh, too. Scale and do it multiple times. And there, and and by the way, I'm gonna have to do that on dozens, tens, hundreds of different data sets. How do I deal with all that complexity? And our sort of core technology is all about that. You know, and even when it comes to the magic of LLMs and AI, you know, we launched chat RWD where a user, clinician, researcher can chat to the data, get a question done in under three minutes. The work that went into that was just thinking really hard about how to use LLMs in an appropriate way. And I think every company, you know, should be an AI company on some level. And that's all we did is we said, hey, like, how should we use this tech? Where is it appropriate? Where is it not appropriate? Where does it lead to a good user experience? That should be the core focus of what we do. And at, at its core, it's just another step of automation. You know, and I think that's what you're seeing in companies uh, like ours and like Seekster at this point is that, you know, automation is the wave around LLMs and AI, right? Now, when you really break that down, sometimes you need magic AI and LLMs to help that automation. Sometimes you just need to have done the hard work and put that stuff together. So you've heard us talk a lot about speed, you know, the one click record, the one click registry, you know, the sort of instantaneous experience that Atchpro creates on creating insights. There's a lot of hard work that went into this behind it. And, you know, as people look at, you know, the emerging technologies and companies in the space, and we think about who the winners might be, I always look at who's done the hard work. And that's what creates the magic. And fundamentally, that's the core of both of our companies. Another reason why I said we're soul sisters in that way, you know, figuring out how to make this change. Thank you. So if we think about that fearlessness, Think about that relentlessness. Let's look to the future. What's the future vision? What's the horizon look like in one decade or two? Yeah, I mean, my dream for this company and for partnerships like the ones we have with Seekster is that every medical decision can be informed by personalized evidence at the point of care. And I, I see it. I can see how it happens. We are already doing it every day okay and in a world where that happens okay what this means is all this work we've done to collect data contribute data build infrastructure is now flowing into value directly okay i think it has the potential to lead to better outcomes for patients we've already published on the impact using our service has at the clinical level i think for pharma we're talking about fundamentally shortening the time to approval for R&D, okay? And once we get a drug approved, to be able to get it paid for by insurance when appropriate. And I see evidence in the wave that we're creating uh, off of great data like Seekster pulls together as having that impact. And I don't think it's 10 years. I think it could be less. 
And I, I'm excited personally, having been working in this industry, you know, for as long as I have. And, you know, as, as already said, back to the early 2000s, this is becoming a reality. And think about that digital experience of a patient. I mean, you know, instead of all the sort of back and forth and, you know, the burden that clinicians have to sort of work through all this workup and all these things. What if the evidence and the insight was at your fingertips? What if that could lead to a great decision for each individual patient backed by the highest quality evidence? And doing that had a great digital experience, you know, was frictionless and led to a better outcome. I, it's there. I see the path to doing it. We are building it every day with great partnerships like Seeks. Thank you. Yeah, and I will, I will add the fact that, you know, um, for, for Seekster and for me personally, it's very personal. So our technology saved my dad's life. We ran a tumor board in six hours on a Saturday, got him into surgery in six business days versus, you know, weeks, if not months. And um, he had a 52 millimeter uh, tumor in his ascending colon. And along with his Cologuard results from exact sciences, which is a genomic test with his CT scans, with all the information from four different providers. We ran a mini registry on a Saturday and my bioinformaticians were able to get that air coordination going to famous pathologists that gave second opinions, wrote letters, and we got it to the chief of staff to get him into surgery. So that relates to millions, if not billions of people at some point. And my entire goal, actually, is how many lives can we save like my dad? And with a partnership like Brigham's, we can bring our high-quality data and finish the last mile and generate brand new things that I think me and Brigham don't even have enough time to even think about or talk about on this podcast. So I'm just very enthusiastic and I can see in the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to make that impact in the next, I would say, 18 to 24 months because our combined solution is one plus one equals 10. And if there's anyone that's listening that's part of healthcare or of life sciences that has a use case, that has a disease cohort, that has a project, they should reach out to either Brigham or myself because we would love to, you know, demo our combined solution to you and see how yeah, we this can is have our call. If, if you have a question, right, clinical question, research question, it is now possible. One click, stand up a registry of patients in that cohort. Another click, get an answer. It's now possible. And that's what this partnership represents. That's what we're enabling. And I think the wave that we're already seeing of Questions people have, right? 14% of daily medical decisions have high quality evidence. That other 86%, those are the questions we're here to answer. And we're, we're seeing it already come to us. We can help is the short answer. Thank you both. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you, Nicole. And so that concludes another episode of the Pharma Forum podcast. You can find out more information about this episode, including a download link and information about previous installments of the series at pharmaforum.com forward slash podcasts. The Pharma Forum podcast is also available on iTunes, Spotify, Acast, Stitcher and Podbean, where you can find and subscribe by searching for Pharma Forum. Of course, don't forget to visit our website itself, where you can sign up for daily news and analysis bulletins, and follow us on Twitter, or X nowadays, at at PharmaForum. That's all for now. Thank you for listening.